Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Sober Yoga Girl Podcast. I'm so excited for this episode. I have Callie sitting with me here. And Callie is someone who has been part of the Mindful Life practice for the last year. She did the Sober Girls Yoga 30 Day Challenge last September. And now she is one year sober. She just graduated our yoga teacher training program. And she's just an all around amazing person. And I'm just so excited to have her here and and hear her story and, and just got an opportunity for her to share. So welcome, Callie. How are you doing? Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm doing good. Um, This week has been great after hitting a year sober. It was just like coming up to a year sober was overwhelming. And I think my pink cloud Sorry, my cat is just trying to get into it. Or... <laughs> I know what that's like. <laughs> it's close, sir. But before the week before I hit a year sober, I was coming up to feeling like I wasn't really doing enough with my sobriety and maybe not doing as many meetings as I should. And I just kind of immersed myself into any option possible in the last two weeks. And I've run into a lot of opportunities that have been great for for sobriety um like for example coding is one of them that i've gotten back into in the last few weeks amazing yeah amazing well i would love to hear more about that but i first would love to hear more about your sober journey so tell me about like what was your life like pre-sobriety well okay so before sobriety I, hmm, back when I was like, I just started drinking probably when I was in at the start of high school. And it was pretty casual then, like just on the weekends. But I really always was dreaming about my weekends of drinking every single week. And I was really, I excelled quite a bit in school. Like I was a good student. I was a rower on the rowing team. I was in band and choir and I had a lot of hobbies, but my most exciting one was still drinking every weekend. So over time, somehow those hobbies just kind of dropped off. And when I went to university and lost the structure of high school, I really realized that I could put all my time into addiction and having fun with experimenting with new... I was experimenting with cannabis and alcohol while I was at uh, university. And it was still keeping it mainly to the weekends and trying to study during the week. But I still had my main focus on the weekends. Um, We it was it was the it was the highlight of my university, to be honest. I ended up dropping out of two two universities and going to college and I found college was like I took a more general program and I thought it was great because I could manage my drinking a lot better while I was in school so my main activities were drinking going to school and I just figured I would put a lot more effort in after I graduated school Um, so I would started drinking and like going to classes. I usually didn't drink right before class, but I'd kind of stumble and hung over and know that I was going to be waiting until the bell rang to hit up the college bar afterwards. And so I kind of noticed that my, I was hitting up the bar after every class and my schoolmates were going home to study, but I could always find one person that I could rope in who either wasn't having a good day or needed to celebrate something that wanted to come and join me at the bar. So for until about 2015-ish, it was pretty fun for me to drink, but I was starting to realize that I wasn't focusing enough on those hobbies from high school, like singing or my physical activity or just kind of moving forward even in my career. I was working in the restaurant industry throughout college and I found that whenever I went to the restaurants, I was serving alcohol to people and I was getting triggered constantly throughout my shifts. And even though I wanted to dial it back, I kept on having a drink after work because it was so easy because everybody else was doing it. But those people, I have no idea how they were living, whether they were doing it often or not. And um, 
really work a big thing in sobriety I've learned is to try to stop comparing myself to people so much. So I was just getting triggered by being near the alcohol and I started drinking more casually and finding friends who wanted to drink after work. And then those friends, we would sit there until about three in the morning drinking and Eventually, when you drink for seven to 10 hours, even though it goes quickly, it does get old eventually. So then you start adding other things like other drugs and something else to the experience. So I just ended up about between like 2015 and 2018. I was going to school still and still working, but managing to find time for my addiction as well. So I just pretty much not sleeping very much. (laughs) And then I went, so when I was at college, I was in Ottawa, Ontario, and I was kind of by myself. I didn't have as many supports as I have in my hometown. And I just was drinking and doing drugs every single night, hanging out with the wrong people on my spare time, but still in school somehow. So I was just making sure that I kept my appearance up for when I came back home to Kingston, Ontario. And finally, in 2018, I ran out of money. I couldn't keep up with my restaurant job anymore. It got to the point where I was graduating university and had to start going out and working in the workforce. And I was working in corporations where there was a lot of drinking at culture at the at work or not dirt as much during work, but around the work place. And And I just got really sucked into it. So I reached out for help in a few places like addiction counseling. And I went to AA. And years ago, the these places were the little there, they were a lot different than they are now. There's there was less of them. And I was the youngest person at my AA meeting. So it never really stuck with me, even though I was trying really hard to quit. So I moved home to Kingston. And I thought maybe this will help me and my parents can help me out because I don't know what else to do. I'm out of money. I don't want to do work anymore. I also had a few experiences like that wouldn't have happened, I think, if I hadn't have been drinking so much throughout my work life, like just experiences with with other co-workers, um, some traumatic experiences, some confrontations. And so I just thought, come home, get refreshed, and I will sober up. So I came home in 2018 and my mom did get me sober for five months. It was really really tough. I'm not sure. Like she just made sure I didn't have access to anything, um, any of the alcohol or drugs. We were in the country, really restricted, but I was still smoking cigarettes and I didn't really, because we were in the country, I wasn't talking to any supports like anybody else who was getting sober or any groups or any physical activity groups or anything. So I felt really lonely in that sobriety time. And um, the second that I had the opportunity to get out and smoke some weed, I took it and I was like, it's okay. It's just this one night. I probably won't do it again. And before long, I think because I hadn't done any of the learning about sobriety and working with others that I know how to handle my emotions still. And I'm still working on that. But I didn't even know that I didn't know how to handle my emotions then. So once I started smoking weed again, it didn't take long before I was drinking again. And so after five months, I fell back into drinking. And I was so mad at myself for falling back into drinking that I truly wanted to just die and not be on earth anymore. And I was like, I'm getting to 30 years old. I've been drinking way more than I should. And my main focus has been drinking for like 15 years. I either need to basically shit or get off the pot is how I felt. And so I thought, got this great idea of spending the next, a lot of my money and the next few years on um, just going as hard as I could with drinking and doing hard drugs to just either die or max myself out to, until I didn't want to do it anymore. So after two years straight of being really messed up every night, I finally um, had a weekend where I added in a new 
new hard drug that I wasn't used to. And I just put myself over my limit with what my body could handle. I was on the phone with the crisis line all weekend. I had to go to urgent care and I didn't end up being checked into the hospital, but it was very close. And I think that if I hadn't had my family who had gotten helped me get sober before, then I probably would have been checked into the hospital a few times. So then finally, I was just like, I can't do it anymore and kind of locked myself in my apartment and tried to isolate myself from all of my triggers and just started the process of sobriety and knew this time I had to do it by myself, for myself. And then it's been nothing. It's been a roller coaster ever since. <laughs> the last year has been wild. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Congratulations on making it to a year because that's like a huge, huge achievement. Thank you. It, it really is so much different than my last time making it five months, like because of the mindful life practice and having someone to talk to when I'm triggered, who's also experiencing similar experiences, having something to reach to for my body to move when I'm not sure what to do with my body, like been so healing for me. So I'm really think that having like toolbox of like many tools is the only way that anyone can get sober and you really need to employ like all resources you could possibly think of and just be like open to saying please help me and like being vulnerable Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what's in your what's in your toolbox right now like you mentioned cold plunging obviously the yoga community. What else do you do? Yeah, I do. So the yoga community is a big one. It's been the first time in my entire life that I've committed to something weekly. Cold plunging, I like to do. um, We do that usually twice a week with a group in town. And it's nice because it's a free event that everyone could go to. And I find that gives me enough of a social experience um, of what I want through this. And then other things that I've been employing into my toolbox lately would be um, actually I I got a sobriety journal and tracker. Mm -hmm. I think journaling has been something really important and I have a great time doing it with people but I've had struggles doing it on my own because of the lack it seems like I don't know want to write on my own basis so I got a sobriety journal like my own formatting um so it gives you like a daily quote and like yeah it kind of gives you like a structure to write in and give you your thoughts and to be grateful so that's another tool is being grateful about things. It's kind of a common theme in a lot of the classes that I've been in. But once you get like once I for the first six months of being sober, I could only say things that I was grateful for, but I couldn't really feel it so much. But after a year of sobriety, it feels like I finally started to rewire my brain to be able to feel grateful about things. And then rewiring my brain reminds me of the fact that I think that neurofeedback therapy was a huge part of my sobriety journey. What's neurofeedback therapy? So it's a non-invasive therapy that um, they've introduced so that it's not only medical practitioners need to can provide it anybody can provide it to people and the machine oh, I think I did this yeah they I keep going I think I did, did it in Kingston yeah oh, you get electrodes like hooked up to your head yeah and they don't do anything painful they just do a gentle rewiring so you do sessions and I did like 45 minutes to an hour sessions and the music would play and you would hear the music skipping a bit every once in a while and that would be the electrodes gently telling your brain to do something else in light of a trigger so if your brain is feeling something anxious um it's just telling your brain no we don't need to feel anxious about this let's rewire so it's i don't know all of the science about it but i know that it feels like it was something that worked for me i did 20 sessions of the neurofeedback therapy and it just i think that was the start of my mind being able to open up to have the ability to rewire yeah that's amazing that's so cool could you see your brain waves on a screen in front of you i couldn't see my um Actually, yes. Yeah, because, okay, 
I had this, I did this by, by mistake, um, long time ago, like, uh, I was probably 20 years old. So like over 10 years ago, um, I was trying to get a referral for psychiatry and I ended up at like a neurofeedback place in Kingston. I was like, I don't know why I'm here. And at the time I, I didn't, I don't think I really saw the value in it because I was, you know, I was a student, I was trying to save money. I was like, I'm at some weird thing where I'm looking at my brain waves. This is not what I want. I want a diagnosis and medication. Like I just wasn't open to all the many different pathways to healing, you know? So anyway, I did one and then I didn't go back, but it, I remember it relaxing me, but I was like, like so resistant to anything like alternative. So that's really cool to hear like what a positive experience it was for you. And it's definitely something I'm curious about. It was amazing. And I said this to the lady who offered it to me was also a therapist, specifically a mm. child therapist. So she was just so awesome with me the entire time. And the, yeah, the process really worked. I was, oh, I was constantly telling her that even if, like, even if at the time I wasn't as open to believing it, and I said, even if this process isn't working, if you saw my life right now and how wild it is, just coming into this office and sitting here for 45 minutes and having mm. this has to be helping me in some way, shape or yeah, form, because yeah. I did much peace in my life at that time. It was very hectic. Um, we were, I was doing a lot of drugs and keep going, moving too fast. So it was my only place to just slow down. It's hard mm -hmm. to find these days. I find that's been a really important part of my journey too, is kind of having a place that you can go that's your own space that's just yours and for years I find like from 18 to 28 years old in our society most people it's really hard to get that and make that space for yourself um really important in my healing journey to just make sure I have even if it's just a little room or a closet that I could decorate myself mm -hmm. yeah, I love my like uh, life. <laughs> yeah it's, it's like a meditation and, and it kind of when we're talking about it, it kind of reminds me of like I had a time period when I was really into tanning, um, like going to tanning beds. Like, I think I was like, I can't remember, probably around the same time, probably like age nine, 18, 19. And I think in hindsight, what I liked about it was that it was like a meditation for like 15 minutes. I couldn't look at my phone. There was nothing going on. I was just in this space. Um, and I thought it was like, I mean, I thought it was like the tanning itself, but I think it's really just having like a meditative space. Yes. I did the same thing. Mm -hmm. So what are your, um, okay, so those are some of your tools for sobriety. Have there been like some setbacks or challenges in the past year? And what uh, have you used to kind of move through them? There have been quite a few setbacks in the last year. I've felt a lot of heaviness and mm -hmm. I feel like I've skipped over it's like the second I quit drinking for the first six months it was all about making sure I didn't drink so getting non-alcoholic drinks and putting them in my fridge and drinking them instead and tricking myself um, and eating a lot of sugar and then the last six months it's been a lot of dealing with emotions from my past that I have never dealt with before I have dated a lot of men in my past and I out never had a problem with like taking time and moving on to the next man and I never really took time to heal between each one and I've found that getting sober it's like a big face smack of you have to you're gonna you're about to go through all those emotions from now until back when you were a kid and it started with getting over each boyfriend that I've ever had since I was 18 and now it's entering into remember coming back with memories from when I was a child so I think that inner child work is going to help me a lot which is something I tried to do at the start of my sobriety journey but that I found was really hard for me to do at the start because it was too hard for me to skip through and go right to the inner child stuff. So I think that yeah. the biggest setbacks has just been trying to like hitting, trying to get myself to deal with things too soon and then emotionally breaking down from them. And usually that ends up in me yelling at a, a f someone close to me or spending days just feeling anxiety in me and feeling like I can't move and like I'm paralyzed almost just dealing with feelings. Um, 
But every day, once I realize that that's what's happening, it starts to get easier and those feelings start to get easier to handle. But I didn't realize that it was going to take months for each situation that you've been in in your life to really process the feeling. So I have really had a lot of issues bringing people into my life, like new people in and meeting people and socializing because I feel like I'm so inside my own head and in my sober journey. So I think that it's been really tough to just learn how to sort organize my life and set boundaries. That's what I had such a problem with and what I was so mad at myself for when I was drinking is that I couldn't set boundaries. And so I think it's just a long, slow lesson on setting boundaries for me. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that so interesting? Like that whole concept of, I think back to many of the things that happened in, in my drinking days. And I'm like, probably if I were sober, a lot less of that would have happened because I would have been, I would have had stronger boundaries. I'm like, what I tolerate, what I don't tolerate. And yeah, I don't think I understood the role I played in the role I played in a lot of what I experienced, you know, exactly how I feel when I'm looking at situations that I went through in the past and wondering how I could have even got there. Because when I wake up today, those ideas don't even into life. So it's really good. And reflecting on it makes me realize how far I've come because just don't happen as often like that. And when they do, I'm sober and get to make the decision. Like I had mentioned in one of our circles this week that my friend needed a ride and we thought, oh, we'll call you a cab. And then I realized I'm sober. Like, I don't need to call a cab. I can come and get you. And we that just saved me money, time. And it was just so easy. And I don't have a panic attack afterwards. So enjoying the sobriety a lot too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Your> family. <laughs> and tell me about your your YTT experience. Like the transformation that you've had in that time has just been like incredible from I remember the first time you were going to teach and feeling so like just nervous about it and um and then to be able to like you led a class for our community last week. So what's that experience been like? It's like it's mind blowing absolutely mind blowing because I was so nervous to go on a camera with everybody at the start. I thought I'll never be able to keep up with these women. And there was so much comparison going on. And now I can't even imagine thinking about comparing myself because I just fit in so well with everybody and we all get along great. And it doesn't feel like, yeah, I've come along. I've been able to develop some confidence um, along the way. I still have my moments, but I've been noticing that when it comes to setting up, like to having some responsibilities and I've been a lot better about that. Whereas when I first joined the sober groups, I remember a, a big talking point for me was that I didn't think I could ever commit to anything weekly. I couldn't get to appointments. That was just not a thing for me. I didn't think I would ever be able to lead anything. I thought that I couldn't be a leader because I was so ashamed of my drinking habits and just tired from drinking for so long and not sleeping enough. So now I almost can't even believe I actually every single day for the last month, I've been like looking around and wondering what's going on in the world. And if it's if I'm really in real life, because I'm like, when I actually lead something, nothing bad happens, everything goes well. And then we just move forward. And moving forward wasn't something I thought I could do before. It felt like every time I talked to somebody when I was drinking, it felt like it was the last time I was ever going to talk to them Mm -hmm. and never get a chance to do anything again. So just understanding that there's always time to do something again in sobriety has been revolutionary. (laughs) I love that. All right. I have one more question for you, which is if you had any advice that you would give to someone who wants to go alcohol free or is in the early stages, what advice would that be? Okay, probably, hmm, probably to just find the thing that you 
one thing that you love the most and try to try to expand that in your life as much as possible. For me, it was mm-hmm. in sobriety that I love my mo- the most. And they were the thing that even though I couldn't be happy about anything else in life or myself, I could always know that my I loved my cat and my cats bring so much peace and they love yoga. And I just think that finding your why is really important. And then just also doing whatever it is that feels right for you, even if someone else thinks it's weird, just like like getting your own space and using like even if it's 15 minutes a day like I would put on Reiki healing music um, and because of the neurofeedback therapy my understanding of it was like just put it on and it will work eventually like even if you're sleeping just throw it on throw it on so I would have Reiki music playing in the background I actually have it playing right now so it's a habit that I've kept and I think that it there's this if you just do all these little things they eventually add up I love that I love that tip oh Callie this has been amazing I think you're so inspiring and it's just incredible to think of like where you came from from when I met you to where you are now it's mind-blowing and it's amazing and it's proof that sobriety works you know when you put in the effort into it and and you really figure out like what's gonna help me get there you'll get there eventually so and anyone can do it I didn't feel like I could do it it didn't feel like I deserved sobriety for some reason but everyone does if that's what they want and it can go really well it's it's a lot of work it can go really well Love that. Thank you so much, Callie. And uh, I'll see you soon. Thank you so much. And you've been my one of my biggest inspirations. So I don't know how I would have done any of this without you. Oh, thank you. So nice. All right.